All right, Saints, well, we've been, you know that we've finished up the series now on Solid Foundation. But there's always a connection when it comes to Solid Foundation because what we're, in, what we're endeavoring to do is to trust God and believe God to help us set a solid foundation. And we've already went over that. We've done several hours of teaching on that, so we won't go through that again. What we want to start with today, we want to look at, uh, introduce a new series called Killing David. Can you say Killing David? David. We're going to take a look at the things that took place in David's life that could have killed his vision, his dreams, and his passion for God. Because there are things that can take take us in a direction to make us feel like, "I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. I don't know if I want to go to back to church anymore. The world is crazy. But, but we, we want, we're going to see from David's life, even though he went through a lot and he did go through a lot, he was still known as a man after God's own heart. My goodness, doesn't that say a lot? A man after God's own heart. So that's what I want you to get out of this. If you get nothing else today, remember, you can be a man after God's own heart. You can be a woman that that's after God. And listen, I want to say this. Let that be your priority. Be a woman or, or a man that, look, I want God's heart in my, if he's your father, then you, you ought to have, you ought to have his heart. If he's the one who birthed you, if he's the one who sired you, okay, then you ought to, ha- you ought to have a heart that's, that's with his, a heart that's after him. And I want to encourage you to let that, with, with everything that's happening, with the pandemic, with the uh, turmoil that's going on, listen, you got to have the right heart. You can't have a heart to look at mess on TV. You can't have a, a heart to worry here and there because, listen, that's, uh, that's organic, okay? You're going to worry if you pay attention to these things. But if you have a heart after God, you'll consider them, but you won't, listen, you won't give it all your attention. And that's where God wants to have a heart for him and not a heart for the things that the world can offer because the things that the world can offer, they can't penetrate your heart. They can't change you. They can't give you contentment. They can't make you feel that, listen, they can't make you feel the confidence that you need to walk as a Christian. They just can't do it. The things of the world just can't do it. How many times have you bought something new? You was pumped up and excited about it. Then after a couple of months, it's like ho-hum drum. Okay. Just another pair of shoes. Just another blouse. You know. It's another, another pair of sneakers, you know, because material things can't do it. But our world will continue to look for that in, in, the, um, in the wakes of this pandemic and a lot of other things that are taking place. But what we want to look at today is a, a man after God's own heart. And this is solid foundation. This is sound doctrine. This is sound doctrine. We need this because if, listen, if you don't, I remember Bishop Holcomb taught us before he passed. He said, if you don't, if, if you don't purposely go for God you, and, and, and go, go for the things of God, you're going to fall for something. Right. Something's going to draw you in. How many of you witness to that? Because we have our human nature. Something will automatically draw us in. So let's look at this. Let's look at what uh, David's life was all about. And uh, we're not going to get really deep into the specifics of his life because I have to give you a backdrop of what was taking place. What was taking place during this time historically? Why is it that David is one of the most celebrated characters in the Bible? Why is that? Why, I mean, it, it, why is he the most celebrated character in the Bible? Why is there more said about David, with the acceptance of Jesus, uh, of Jesus, of course, but there's more said about David in the Old Testament than any other character? Why is that? Why do they bring him up in the New Testament? What's actually going on? Well, those who you don't know a lot about David, let me introduce him to you. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, David, who was he? He was the youngest son of Jesse. And we're going to get into all this. He was a a youthful shepherd boy. I like that part. He was a giant slayer. (laughs) He was he was a teenage king elect. You hear what I'm saying? A teenager that was a king elect. God had already anointed him to take the presidency for that nation. Somebody say yes, Lord. He was a songwriter and composer. He was Jonathan's best friend. He was a personal musician for King Saul himself. And it's important for us to understand that not only that, but he was a hunted fugitive at one time that raised up to the highest position in the nation, King of Israel. 
You need to understand what David went through. David, he, what makes him so beautiful, what attracts us to him is that even though he had struggles, he had the ability to bounce back. Yes. Because he was a man that was after God's own heart. That's, and that's what I want to leave with you today. Make sure that you're after God's heart. I want God to be pleased. As, as the elder was saying on the exhortation, I mean, I want to please God. If, listen, if you please God, everything else falls in line. You please God and you serve people. Can we say that? Please. please God and and serve one more time. We please God and serve people. You don't try to please people. There's too many of them. Amen. You please one, an audience of one. You please who? God. And God will give you the strength to serve people. Be trying to please people. They'll wear you out. There's too many because they got too many needs. No, please God and he gives you the strength to serve that person. And then as you serve that person, God will begin to change and melt their heart. Somebody say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. David knew how to pivot. That's what it was. And we, we, we see that David, he was an interesting character. What draws us to him is he had great tragedies in his life, but he also had great victories. David knew how to go out and win a war, but we found out that he was weak when it came to his home life. He was uniquely gifted, but, but, but he was still, he was... He was human to the core. I mean, he was, he, he was, what gets me about David is that he, he was, he was like blood, bone, and breath, just like you and me. Yes. Yes. But he still was called a man after God's own heart. Doesn't that give you encouragement to know that he wasn't all that, but he was still, God still said, he's after my heart. So if you made mistakes before, that, that's not what qualifies you. What qualifies you is when God says, you're still after my heart. Yeah, you messed up, but you're still after my heart. I'm going to take care of you. I'm still going to take care of you because you're a person after God's own heart. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm telling you, saints, we got to have something that we're going for these days, and it has to be going after the heart of God. Can somebody say the heart of God? So David was blood, bone, and breath, and he struggled just like you and I struggle with spirit, soul, and body. He didn't get it right all the time. We're going to see that. We won't be able to cover it today, but we, we can see how he struggled a lot. I mean, David had some huge struggles. But listen to this, though. If your ep how can your epitaph read a man after God's own heart? You know, <laughs> with the mistakes that David made. It, it just doesn't make sense. And it, if, if you're not careful, that's why I want to introduce David to you the right way. If you're not careful, you'll read the highlights of David's life. And if you're not careful, you'll surmise that he was a, he was a superman in that day and time working in a city without a trace of kryptonite. Yes. You think there was nothing that he went into. He didn't have any issues or any problems. This is why it's important to go through and take a look at David's life because we'll be able to relate to him. We'll, we'll be able to see how important it is to, to see that you can fall and still be a person after God's own heart. Boy, that encourages me. I say that encourages me. David was not studied. Like I said, he wasn't studied with a, a whole bunch of human qualities. In fact, let's go to 1 Corinthians, first chapter and verses number 26. And, and Paul, boy, he helps us understand this. Paul said, you see your calling. Yes, sir. He said, look, I'm trying to get your attention. See, look at your calling. Yes. He said, see how that not, not many of you have been wise. Right. He said, you know, no, you ain't been wise after the flesh. Not many of you mighty or noble are called. He's not saying a noble person can't be called, but God does not look for his servants based upon Atlas physiques and Einstein mentalities. Right. He's looking at your heart. Can I trust you with the money? Can I trust you with a person's life? Will you call them when you don't feel like calling them? Will you pray for them when you don't even feel? You tired, you don't even want to pray for yourself. But will you do it? Can I trust you? Can I trust you? That's it. David knew how to bounce back. Man, he would bounce back. In the Bible, it says about, you know, he went through the issues with adultery with Bathsheba, and he had a child out of that, and he was praying, God, please save him a child. The Bible says that he was fasting, sackcloth and ashes on his head, and, and as soon as he found out the child was dead, the Bible says he got up, changed his clothes, washed his face, 
all the beard down and stuff, got himself ready, and went back to his duties. And the mourner was saying, what are you doing, Dave? The, 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 your, your son, he just died. What are you doing? And he made it very clear. He said, look, while, while he was with me, he said, I had a chance that he could live. And he said, now that he's gone, I can't bring him back, but I can go where he is. That gives us great hope in the Bible. While people are losing hope and not sure what they're going to do, this gives us great hope. Can somebody say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. He goes further even here after he says, see, you're calling. Look at verses number 27. He says, look, according to the flesh, ain't nobody impressing God. God has chosen foolish things of the world to confound. I bring people in the church that had a broken life, broken relationships, people giving up on them. I bring them to the church. I get, listen, I give them character again. I give them integrity again. And when people look at them, they say, man, that is an honorable person. Only God can make you look like you've never been again. And some of us, we've been through, haven't we? But only God can make you like you've never been again, make you look pristine. Things of this world, he used the foolish to confound the wise so that people who think they're sharp, they're like, how did you get in? Right. Oh my God. Oh my God. How, how did you? Well, you you're his disciples? Yeah. Man, they must be Jesus. They sound just like him. Yeah. Fishermen. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Fishermen. And God has chosen the weak things of the world, gosh, to confound the things which are mighty. Y'all hear that sound? God trying to tune in. You better listen. He, he's chosen the weak things to confound those who wise and they think they're sharp. And God says in, I think it's 2 Corinthians 12th chapter 9th verse, it says when you're weak, he's strong. But first you got to acknowledge that you don't have it all together. Even when you have the money, that doesn't mean you have it together. That means you got that portion together. But don't neglect your heart. Mm. He used the weak things of the world to confine those who are mighty. One more verse we'll look at, and then we'll let this go. And base. Mm. God uses base things. Are you, are you catching it? The base yeah. things in the world, boy, I, it, that just blows my mind. Why would he use something? Ba- God will use base people like you and like I, who was caught up in some dumb, perverted relationship, thinking somebody was loving us, and they didn't even understand what love was. And he'll use somebody that's been a base, and he'll raise you up, and people will look at you, they'll say, there's no way you ever been through that. No way. They can't understand it. They can't understand it. You had like your life has been good all your life. Right. What do you mean you never had a mother or father? What do you mean? Right. Well, how can you have this much confidence? Yeah. What do you mean you was born in the projects and, and God brought you out? What do you mean your, your f- family did drugs and just fought? Out? We used the base things. Yeah. Base things. Because yes, people appreciate God when he brings them from the base things. Yeah. Somebody say, yes, Lord. Yeah. Some of you, you need to say, you know, you say, look at your account. You know, some of you wasn't wise. You know what type of stuff you were in. Amen. You know what you were in. Where would I be yeah. if it wasn't for God in my life? I'd be in some dumb relationship trying to make it work, probably on my way out looking for another person. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God for salvation. Can somebody say, yes, Lord? yes, Lord? So we see that God's method of choosing runs opposite and opposed to human reason. Yeah. All right, God, try and tune you in. So it, it, we, we have to understand that it does, now when you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Why would God take a powerful, strong man of God, prophet by the name of Samuel, and have him go and anoint a little ruddy, sweaty shepherd boy playing in the fields? Why are you going to anoint him, God? Can't you find somebody better than that? Can't you find somebody better than this little ruddy boy that don't know what's, don't know what's going on in the world? Yes. And God chooses the weak things to confound the things yes, that are mighty. Yes. Boy, I love the way he operates. Because the way God operates, everybody qualifies. Yes. Like we used to say in Germany, la di yes. Everybody qualifies up in here. But, and, and so what, what, what moved God to come toward David was because David had a heart that, that, that hungered and thirst for righteousness. Yes. He didn't know nothing out in the field, sweaty, smelly, taking care of the sheep, just playing his music. You know, praise the Lord. And God said, that's my man. That's my man. 
Oh, yeah. That's my man. That's the person that I'm going to anoint. And it's a beautiful saints. If you go back and look at the story, oh, I ain't got time to cover all that. But if you go back and look at the story, you remember when God said to, to, to Samuel, he said, get up and quit crying. He said, I've already found a man after my own heart. Do you know that was, that was, that was, there was 20 years between that time and then when David got anointed? Scholars say it was 20 years. You know what I mean? God said, I've chosen a man after my heart before David was born. How are you going to deal with the mind of God? He had already chosen him. But we do have a choice. Get your life together. Do the things that are right so that he can put an anointing on you. People say, man, I like that guy, man. I don't know what it is. Favor. I can't explain. I just like him. You know, I think this person is so positive, you know, but God brings you to a place like that. And you d- listen, if you've been down, then you qualify. You ever been depressed? You qualify. You ever thought you weren't going to make it? You qualify. You ever not have enough money? You qualify. Your marriage ever been about to mess up? You qualify. You ever feel like leaving a church? You qualify. You qualify. You're in a good place. Somebody say, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. That's why he says you have to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we need to give some backdrop. But before we give you backdrop, there was a king that reigned before David. His name was King Saul. We may be able to touch a little bit on him today, but I got, I got to give you some background. But before I give you the background, there's something I want you to see about David so you can see that he's really a man after God's own heart. And let's take a look at that. Let's go to Psalms 139. And he said, read this one with me. Oh, Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. You know my down sitting and my uprising. Let's just go skip to verse 23. This is just too much. If I keep reading, I get lost and I won't finish the message. Let's just jump to verse 23. And he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Read that with me, saints. Come on. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Now, you've got to admit that's scary. I want to encourage you to pray. Pray it. Because the time, we're in the last days, and some things need to be accelerated in your life. Oh, boy, here we go. You need to accelerate some things in your life, okay? You can't wait around and hope you'll finally come around. One message is going to finally turn you around. No, listen, the, the time is short. We got to get things done and accomplished, okay? So accelerate. I'm telling you right now, put, put your foot on the accelerator. Quit pumping the brakes. You don't pump the brakes all the time. Put your foot on the accelerator and mash that thing. And God is saying, listen, David said, search me, oh God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts. Now, let me tell you, when you pray this prayer, God, does, God is not trying to search you and know what's in your heart or know your thoughts. Because we just read, he knows you're down sitting and you're up rising. He knows the thought that's about to come. You don't even know it's coming. And the thought comes to you and it tells you to go in that refrigerator and get something and warm it up and eat it. He knows it before it gets there. So if God knows these thoughts, that means he can. Oh, here we go. That means he can help you with your health. Yes, sir. Come on, sir. He can help you every time you try to frequent that refrigerator. (laughs) He knows you're down sitting and you're uprising. So when you ask God to search your heart, don't think he's going to search you so that he can know you. He's going to search you so that he can let you begin to know yourself. And that's why a good prayer, you may want to write this down. God, reveal me to me as I appear to thee. Yeah, quit relying on people that's going to talk to you and make you feel good. I mean, that's good for encouragement. But that's not good for introspection. We all need encouragement, but an average human can't give you the right introspection that's needed. It's going to take the spirit of God through the scriptures or hearing someone say something and that thing opening your heart. Can somebody say yes, Lord? Lord. So when you say God search me, he's not searching you to know something because he already knows it. He's trying to show it to you and get you to slow down. So search me, God. Try me. Put me in a situation where I get tried and then see what comes out of my heart. He already knows what's going to come out. He's just got to get that information to you. God is not deceived. We are. 
So search. He'll search you. And it, like we said, we were touching a couple of weeks ago. That's like somebody, uh, a cop comes and he, he, he said, well, you look like somebody. We need to search you. We got somebody on the loose. And they, 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 they check you because they want to find out what you got on you and what you carry in and what is your identity. God knows all those things already. You already know what you carry in and what you not carry in. He already knows that. So when he searched, he makes a thorough search. But God makes the search so thorough that when he's finished, you're going to know more about yourself than you did when you went in. That's the person that's after God's, God's own heart. David says in verse 19 and 22, we're not going to turn. He said, God, get these people from, from around me. I don't want them around me. I wish you would. This is what he said. I wish you would slay them. I'm tired of dealing with these people that don't believe in you. Then he says, search me, God, and, 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 and see what's in my heart, God. And so I, this is what I want you to remember. Let me, let, me, let me say this. Let me slow down. I want you to hear this. When you're dealing with, we're dealing with a lot of unrest, and a lot of it is around, is around George Floyd. If, if we back up, we remember uh, uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, uh, Ahmaud uh, Aubrey, Ahmaud Aubrey, okay? Now, in these investigations now, they're saying, listen, we want to, we want a full investigation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We want the, the uh, attorney general, is it attorney general? Yes. We want them to come out. We want, um, we demand a full investigation. Yes. How did it happen? When did it happen? Who gave the order? What was the information based upon? What is the protocol? How did you get to a place where you did this? People are demanding a full investigation. Listen, David was so confident. Yes. He was so confident that he was going to be better after this thing. He said, God, I demand a full investigation. Oh, sir. It's not because I know I'm tough. No, 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 no. But because I know I can't stay where I am. I'm moving too slow, God. I'm moving too slow. I need you to go ahead and try me and judge me. Put me in a situation. If I don't believe it's in my heart, put me in a situation and let it come up and crop out of my heart. Then I'll be like, oh, God. Search me. Know me. He's basically saying, help me to know myself. Mm, mm, mm. God help me. And we understand what happens in these situations. We know when the search went on with the uh, Armand Aubrey, we, we found out that these weren't, these weren't people who were caring about their community. We found out when he was on the ground, he was, they were using racial slurs and cursing while he was on the ground dying after they shot him. You see, an investigation brought that out. Some of us, we need to just let the Lord have a full-fledged investigation. God, I want a full investigation. I'm tired of playing church. I'm getting kind of weary of coming to church, fall in, then fall back out of church, you know, once or twice a week. God, I need an investigation. A full investigation. Full investigation. Come on. Somebody say, yes, Lord. So David is demanding a full investigation. Here it is, saints. True believers, they don't fear an investigation. They're a little apprehensive about it, but they know in the end, they're going to come out better. Right. Woo. So they're like, God, judge me and judge me quickly. Right. Uh, true believers, they, they, they understand that, that it's, it's a little trouble when it comes to the, the, the eternal weight of glory that they'll receive after it's over. It's, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of like exercising. You know, Paul says. Uh, exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Yeah. And the way you do that, God, try me. Yeah. Try me. God, I think I'm doing pretty good riding down the road. I think I'm doing pretty good. And God, I don't see anything that's, that's really wrong with me. And you know, I'm trying to do, God, reveal my heart unto me. Yeah. Yes, God, in the name of Jesus. And somebody pulls in front of you, slam on you. Oh, what are you doing, fool? Man, man, wrong with you, man. Got it. Oh. Yes, sir. Thank you. You just revealed it to me. Thank you, Father. So David said, I'm demanding a full investigation. I need to get to the bottom of me. Thank you so much for being here. 
If this word has been a blessing to you, and I do believe it has, we want you to hit that share button. Right. We want to make sure that every single Sunday you are visiting with us. Remember, on Wednesday night, we have our Bible studies right here as well, uh, the Pensacola Life Church at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And if you want to give an offering, for I know a lot of Life Church members are out there right now. Remember, there are a couple of different ways that you can continue to give. You can go to our website, plife.org. Org, yes, yes. And you can hit up, uh, tap the button up in the right hand side and you can give your tithes, your offering or donations for everybody else out there. Mm -hmm. You can do that through PayPal. Mm -hmm. You can also go to your cash app. That's mm -hmm. the cash app sign, Pensacola Life Church. And then, of course, if you have the app, Givelify. Once again, Pensacola Life Church, guys. Thank you for being here today. We will see you Wednesday night Bible study at 7 p.m. But between now and Wednesday, do not forget uh -oh. to shelter in. We love you so much. God bless you. Somebody say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Uh, uh, true Christians are willing to be tested by God. And they have faith. They have faith. They don't mind being tried by other people. Boy, this is a lot. Being judged by your peers is not enough for a real Christian. Thank you for the compliments. Thank you for the encouragement. Yes. But I need God to try my heart. Yeah. I appreciate all you guys did. And you said it wasn't my fault. And yeah, da, da, da. I appreciate that. But I got, I'm sorry. I got to go back and I got to order a full investigation. Because I, I got to find out what's really going on. Yes. Amen. Like Kelly always said, we're kind of biased toward ourselves. Yes. We, we, we look at other people. You say, well, God, at least I'm not like that. That's not the recipe for in, in introspection for God to interpenetrate your being and begin to talk to you. The recipe is, God, try my heart. Search me and see if there's some wicked, ill-gotten way in me. Mm, mm, mm. It is, Kelly. These are secret faults. Let me tell you something else about true Christians. They're willing to hear the worst as well as hearing the best about their selves. Here's another thing. They're confident that they will come out much better than when they went in. Another thing that true Christians, though they know faith is like gold. In fact, go to first Peter, first chapter, verse number six. First, yeah, I think it's first Peter, first chapter, verse six. I believe that's it. Yeah, yeah. See, true Christians understand it. You know, the Bible calls your faith as gold. It says like gold. True believers know that what God has given you with faith is really gold. Right. And they understand. Most of us understand in a refiner's fire, the way you get the gold more pure so that it can cost more right. is that, come on, you put the gold in the fire. You let the heat get turned up on your circumstances. Let the heat get turned up on your circumstances. Let the situation happen in front of you, right in front of your face. How dare they say that to me? Don't they know who I am? That's the problem. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Nobody wants to go through temptation, but look what's taking place. Let's look at the next verse of Scripture. That the trial of your faith, being more precious than that of gold, that though it be tried with fire. Yes. See, the whole point of this verse of Scripture is not really dealing with, it's not really, the emphasis is not on your faith. Even though we're talking about faith, the emphasis on, is on the trial. Right. Because the trial bring out the faith. Come on, sir. It lets you see where your faith is located. That's right. So, God, try me. Yes. Try me. Yes. Or do you have time to casually wait for something to come up to get you upset? Maybe you got time to wait. I don't know. I'm tired of waiting. I'm slow when it comes to getting myself right. It's, it's like gold that perishes, though, be tried with fire. See, it's the fire. It's the trial of your faith. Not so much the faith because God has given every man, according to the book of Romans, the measure of faith. Okay? That means everybody in here has the same measure of faith. You don't have a measure of faith. You have the measure that God gives to every man. Isn't that good to know? Right. You got to, listen, you got the same faith as the forefathers had. Yeah. You got the same faith of Moses, Paul. You got, listen, you got the same faith of Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes. Right. Huh, I know you don't believe it. 
I know it's hard to believe, but it's, it's called God has given every man the measure of faith. He didn't say a. Now, if he said a measure of faith, we would be in trouble. Because that would be like going down. It would be like going down to the, working at the soup kitchen. And instead of them using one, the measure with the ladle in order to get you the soup, they use different ones. Yes, sir. Different ones. No, God doesn't do that. He gives you the measure, Amen. not a measure. Yes. That means everybody gets the same amount yes. faith, yes, sir. regardless of your age, your upbringing, your, your theology, what church you went to, what church you didn't go to, what, what school you went to makes no difference. You're getting the same measure of faith. And that faith needs to be tried through fire. Amen. So after the refiner puts the gold in the fire in that pot and he just keeps stoking it and putting stuff on it, he wants to get the heat up as high as it can. Most of you know about this because what happens is that at the top of that pot, what comes up? The dross, the dirt. Then he skims that dirt off and now he has pure gold. That's what Paul meant when he said unfeigned faith. Book of Timothy. He said, we need unfeigned faith. He's talking about a pure faith that has been tried. Right. And that's what happens when people are after God's own heart. It's like, God, try me. And I'm not saying that with pride, God. I'm saying as humble as I can because I'm kind of scared, but try me. See if there'd be some wicked way in me. Can somebody say yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. As we covered earlier this year, that's the beauty of fasting. You put your foot on the accelerator. Yes. Instead of waiting for something to happen, it's like I'm going to initiate the fight. Right. I'm getting ready to go on a fast. Come on. Oh, that is so good, man. I ain't waiting around. I'm going to go on a fast. I'm going to initiate the struggle. Yes, sir. I'm not afraid anymore of the struggle. I'm not afraid of temptation, tests, and trials anymore because now I understand it's going to make my faith come up as pure gold. Yes. Yes. Amen. It's like, bring it on. Bring it on. Now, God, listen to this, saints. I want to get this. God... I know people say God brings and he'll put you through a trial and there's some truth to that. But let me give you some clarity to that. OK, you need some clarity. Yes. There is no way God's going to use something evil to try you and make you better. That's yes. My God. God is better than that. That's right. yes. But he'll use the foolish things in the world and let you go through it in order to make you better. That's right. Remember, Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness, not to be tempted of God, but to be tempted of the devil. But he was still led by the spirit of God. Amen. Don't be so quick to jump on the devil when God leads you into temptation, not to make you fall, but to let you see some things about yourself. Amen. Can somebody say yes, Lord? Yes. That's what people do who are people after God's own heart. They welcome a teaching on sound doctrine that, that, pleases, them, that pleases them and at the same time incriminates them. Yeah, come on, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> I ain't mean to go this way today. I don't know what's going on, but this is good. I'm preaching to myself, yes, man. Got to go home and get this thing right. But real, real people who have a heart for God, they don't mind being incriminated because they know as soon as the incriminated the trial is over, God is going to free me. I don't stay in bondage. Jesus paid the price. I get freed. I walk out of jail. I won't be in jail to my flesh anymore. I won't be in jail to my carnal nature anymore that has the ability, uncanny ability, to get upset sometimes and stay upset for two, three days, a week, and don't want to come out of it. God, I'm tired of that. I'm, I'm weary of that. Yes, sir. Try me. Put me through a trial. Somebody say yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's like gold, but it has to be tried has to be tried, saints. And that's one of the things that, that, that people who are, are people after God's own hearts, one of the things they love about the word of God, they know in the end it's quick, powerful, and sharper than any. Something is going to be divided when I go through this trial. God's going to divide stuff, and he's going to separate. Remember, sanctify means to what? Separate. He's going to separate some stuff so you can look at it and say, oh, that, oh that's me. Ah, oh. Okay, God, I got it now. 
That's me. That's me. I'm going to have to get that part of my life right. They're willing to put themselves in that crucible because they know that the outcome will be great. They cherish truth in the inward parts. Like it says in Psalms 51 and 6, when David fell in adultery, he said, God, I won't know you want truth in the inward parts. That's what true Christians that are after God's own heart, that's how they feel about it. They're different in heart than a regular Christian. They, they just different. They like, God, try me. They Show me my thoughts that are run away. Show you my thoughts that I don't even crucify. Yes. Show me the thoughts that are like runaway fugitives in my mind. Take me to a place I know I shouldn't be. Try me. Yes. See if there be some wicked way in me. Can somebody say, yes, Lord? Yes, Lord. And then it goes on to, um, if you would go back to Psalms 139. Verse 23 and 24. We're almost about to close here, saints. Thank you, Jesus. God's method of choosing people is diametrically opposed to human reasoning. Amen. You've got to understand that. Yes. You may think you're making, listen, listen to this. You may think you're making no progress. Think you're in the same place that you've been for the last year. But if you're a person after God's own heart, you're making progress. Hallelujah. And you're going to see a change. Yes. You're going to see God bring you into places they've been wanting to bring you all the time. On, but he yeah. couldn't do it before. Yes. On, yes. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me. Yes. Know my thoughts. Yes. The next verse of scripture, he says, well, I like this. And see if there be any wicked, ill-gotten way inside me. Yes. Well, I always try to get my own way. Right. Yes. And lead me. In the way, saints, you won't be led into the way everlasting until you allow God to search your heart. You'll stay in the way that you are. Come on, you know it. We'll keep doing what we do. Why rock the boat? If it ain't broke, I'm not going to fix it. We will not change our way, especially if they're working. You shouldn't until somebody can show us that the way we're going is not right. And only God has the ability to penetrate the human heart and show you what's not right. Yes, sir. right. Yes. Only God. Can somebody say only God? Only God. Ain't nobody else that can do it. Yes. So as we close here, let me give you some insight on what David was dealing with before, uh, well, how things were taking place before he came to be the king of Israel. Amen. Anybody interested in that? Yes. So we know now that God's method of choosing is diametrically opposed to human reasoning. So what we see now, we see before David got there, a lot was happening. Before David became king of Israel, we find out that 40 years had passed when God had stopped the judges. Remember the judges that used to judge the people, judge the nation? That had stopped 40 years out the winter. And it says in Judges 20. One and 25, I think it says, it says that at, at this time, people had so drifted from God. Sounds like America, doesn't it? They so drifted from God that every man did what was right. It's about what I think is right. Every man. So David was coming into a, a scene where people were, they were messed up. They were living backwards. And they were living insane and they were doing stupid stuff. I mean, have you seen have you seen some of the stupid stuff that's taking place these days? Yeah. Let me just out of your mind the things that people are doing. They're not even giving things thought. So this is where the nation of Israel were. And the elders came together like, man, we can't keep living like this, man. We're abusing our own selves. Yeah. We're, we're, we're seeing man's inhumanity to him own self. Yes, we can't put up with this. Anymore. Let's go see the prophet. Yes. What were they were saying? Judge me. Search me. See, when you deal with the Old Testament and the New Testament, the, the Old Testament is types and shadows. The, new, it, the Old Testament is the root and the New Testament is the blossom. It's, it's the fruit, right? And so we see the types and shadows in the Old Testament. Why is that? Why is that? Well, the prophet was a type of the Holy Spirit. And the people who came to him was a type of us, our soul saying, look, I need somebody to search me because I can't uncover these deep idiosyncrasies that's in my heart. I can't uncover why I got these existential quirks going on in my head. I I can't understand why this, I'm I'm proud and I'm strong on this little thing here brings me fear. I don't understand. I need somebody to search my heart. 
see what's in there and explain these things to me. So, so here we go. The, the, the nation of Israel was suffering. They go to the prophet and they say, prophet, look, man, we, we won't help. But, but watch the problem, how it develops. They say, look, um, what we want, what we want. You just had what you want. What we want is we want a king that can judge us and be like the people in the world. They missed it. We, we want a king. And God gave them a king, too. And boy, if you go through the book of Kings, you'll see they wish they never knew the word king. He explained to him, I'll give you a king and this is what's going to happen. You know, but you want it. He said, I'm going to give it to you. So in comes a guy by the name of Saul. Saul comes on the scene. Why did they select Saul as king? The Bible says, well, you got to hear this. If you went to a car lot, he would have been the Maserati on the car lot. If you, if you went to, to a real estate agent, he would have been the $750,000 house with the big pool in the back. Right. Come on, sir. He, he, he was the man. The Bible said he was head and shoulders above every man. Walked straight. He looked like a great model. And he walked, boy, the way he carried himself. That's the next king. But we know God does not choose his people according to human standards. So in, here comes Saul. He comes in. Everybody loves him. Um, and it didn't take long under pressure. We, be see, we begin to see his character begin to crack. Integrity wasn't there. He thought too much of himself. When other people didn't accept him, he would give in and go do what they wanted him to do. Cracks in the character begin to come immediately. And the reason this happened, listen, because it wasn't God's choice. It was the people's choice. That's what's hurting us today. Yes. Not, not the, no, no, because we, we want our choice. I want somebody to look like a president. I'm not saying, and I'm not saying this to qualify the presidents that's in there now, okay? All right? I'm not saying that. But, but our thing is we want people to look the right way. We want them to walk the right way and wear the right suit and have a Hugo Boss suit and walk like you're distinguished and you're a diplomat. And we don't care nothing about their character. No, nothing. We want them to look right, and if they can, they can identify with me, if they can be my color, or they can be from my neck of the woods, I'll put them in the White House. And for years, they've been playing the same thing that King Saul was playing himself. He was trying to play with the masses. And that's how politics work. Am I right about it? They play, listen, they play, it's called class warfare. Yes, sir. They play you. They say, if you elect me, I'll take care of you. I'll give you this, and I'll give you more of these. And you get a free couple of these. Yes. Let me let, let me get in office and, and listen. And they are quickly identified with the masses because the mass masses of people are the ones who are not doing very well. So I'm identified with you. And once you think I'm a part of you, then I can reverse the thing and I can say it's us against them. Classic, classic class warfare happens every four years and we still don't understand it. Class warfare. They got in there who they wanted. They got Saul in there. But once again, God does not choose by human standards and human reasoning. He wants a man that's after his heart. He wants somebody who's hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Saul was not hungering and he was not thirsting after righteousness. He was not God's choice. He was the people's choice. We're going to find out more about that next week because I'm out of time. Praise God. Stand to your feet, please. Let's give God a praise. Woo.